So welcome to the first real episode of Hashbang TV. I'm not sure if you saw the preview show, uh, but if you didn't, this is kind of like a, a web show talking about the UK technology scene, what's going on with kind of startups and early stage companies. Um, and I'm James. And I'm Chris. Excellent. So this week, uh, we're going to talk about kind of reflecting back on what we learned and doing it for the first time. Um, we've got our first ever guest. Uh, so we have an interview segment, uh, which is exciting. So you'll be seeing that later on. Um, so yeah, I mean, what, so what did, what's your take? We've done this, this is our second time now. We what? survived. It yeah. was good. Feedback was interesting. Hmm. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for, uh, one of the big problems was that uh, the day that we recorded the show, uh, I had a bunch of equipment in my bag. I went off to the London School of Economics yeah. and uh, went to the pub afterwards and somebody stole my bag. It had a MacBook Pro in it, a iPad, it had the SD cards from the recording. So what we ended up with last time was a single camera view um, and really bad audio because the stuff that was stolen was the other camera and the audio recording. So it's a bit of a disaster, both personally and... So the lesson there is don't go and get drunk after shooting... I wasn't the drunk, I had one pint. Mm, okay, so you're just basically careless. Yeah, but we survived. I think you posted we're resilient, right? Yeah, it makes us stronger. Whatever. And now look, look, actually look, look at this location. So like in the preview show, shooting against this horrible, soulless, blank wall. And now look, we're in this beautiful location. We've got a nice microphone. We have. And uh, we're back. You've got a new Mac. Hashbang TV. Hashbang TV, yeah. So nothing will stop us bringing you this stuff to you, even if you don't want us to. <laughs> we had quite a few views. People watched it. People watched it through to the end. We're very yeah, happy. Yeah, I, I, I was mean, really happy with what, you know. Surprised. We yes. Yeah, I, Happily I, surprised. The take up was pretty good, I thought. Um, you know, obviously this show will go out in a few days time after we're shooting it, so the numbers will change, but um, yeah, you know, it's a good first start, I think. I think what's, not so much the actual traffic that we've got, but I think what's really been surprising and actually really, really nice is the reaction we've got from, you know, we, obviously a lot of people we know in the industry and a lot of friends have just been really positive about it. Uh, we, we started talking to people about being guests on the show and... Um, Everyone wants to be on the show, so that's kind of encouraging. Yeah, the message was keep going. Yeah, keep despite going. how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Despite keep Chris, going. keep going. <laughs> yeah. That's what people yeah. keep telling me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay, so uh, so what's been going on uh, since the, the, the last show? Well, So you had your stuff stolen at the at the Eric Rees uh, Lean Startup Talk, right? Yeah, exactly. How so did that go? It was good, yeah. So the actual theft is what we call validated learning, you know, which okay. is one of the things in the book, as you'll remember. So it was brilliant, actually. So um, London School of Economics, big kind of lecture theatre, um, and he was really, a really, really good speaker. Hmm. You know, so obviously most of the people who had read the book already, and he presented a lot of material from the book, um, and, and it was just funny. He was just, you know, he had relevant experience. He was obviously very clever, but he was really funny in his delivery as well. Right. Um, so in case people haven't read the book or seen any of the materials, sort of, it, it was... Pivot! The, pivot! MVP. I've yeah. read the book. You've read the it's book, It's all about obviously. pivot. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 it, and at the end of the book, he talks about he doesn't want pivot to be the buzzword that it's already become. No more um, pivot. No more pivot. So we're not allowed to pivot the show. Un Unpivoting. We can pivot this show. What should we pivot to? No, no, no. Okay. Maybe just audio, so they don't have to look at your face. Maybe. Um, so, I mean, it was the must read book of last year. If you're a startup, if you're trying to be uh, an innovator within a big business, then, you know, there's some, some great stuff in there. It's based on um, a book which I didn't realise, so The Four Steps of the Epiphany. Eric Ries was involved in that book, he edited that book, and, and I think the, the Lean Startup and the Lean Startup movement is the logical next step from, the, from this idea of, of, of uh, product and, and customer feedback within product development. Yeah. The book covers big companies and you know, these early stage businesses, and the, the sort of two experiences, the two big takeaways from his presentation at the London School of Economics was, you know, have this minimal viable product have something that will test it because you can go on forever without launching yeah. and never get any of that feedback. So that's hugely important yeah. um, and we, you know, I've taken that on. And then the use of measurement and metrics you know, and experimentation and seeing. So you create baseline metrics yeah. um, and then you test something. So it might be A-B testing on a website, it might be changing your you know, customer acquisition flow and then work out and just keep experimenting, keep yeah. doing that. That's what we're doing. And if you find that you're just in this pit and it's not growing, stop. Or um, pivot. Or 
pivot. That's right. Um, but I'm never satisfied, right? So I'd quite like to see a, another book in the same vein. Uh, and what it should do is just focus on the startup scene, you know, mm. the early stage company. Forget about trying to be an innovator in a big business. And I understand mm. why the lean startup is like that. I want a book which is pointy, bullet pointy kind of information about how to use that methodology in a startup. So more detail about the metrics. Yeah. Um, I, I want it to be like um, the Guy Kawasaki book, The Art of the Start. It tells me exactly what I need to do. If I follow those bullet points, I'll do something good. Really? Yeah. You're absolutely. not following him then? I'll ignore that. Okay. Um, and, and so I want, I want that Lean Startup book, the, 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 I don't know, the handbook for startups using the Lean, the lean mentality. But do you really? Because the, the, if everyone had a template on how to run a successful startup, You'd have everyone trying to do it, loads of competition. Everyone needs that. Every good startup or, or business has its own secret sauce. It's not templated. Yeah, but it's not. It, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you know the, how to do that measurement, how to do that experimentation. I thought it was. I mean, it's a great piece. It's slightly a bit too broad and slightly too academic. And I want something that just says mm. these, these are things. So there are startups loads of for dummies. Is what you need. Yeah, but specifically in this in this sort of lean mentality, um, and you know ha there are loads of resources on the web. So if you search for lean startup on the web, there is the Eric Reese website, and there's loads of people posting information up there. I want that condensed into a book, uh, and I think you know Random House or Penguin Portfolio should commission that book. Maybe Eric should be the person to curate it, yeah. and it's thinner, it's less academic, it's pointy, and it's focused on you know, less than 10 employees. Yeah. Of course, other people will, will, will buy it and read it, but it needs to be more focused for me. And that's hypercritical, so I think the book's amazing, and the, and the, and the thing's amazing. Yeah. But, um, so that was my, that's my impression. That's interesting, actually, because I think there's going to be more and more books that are published, which are essentially collections of blog posts or yeah. online content. Yeah. So, Joel on Software is a good example of that, right? What is you it? Read Joel on Software? No. Great book, you should read that. It's about kind of, you know, software engineering and being inside a you know young lean companies, he came from Microsoft though. He was, a, he was part of the Excel okay. development team. Brilliant, uh, but it is like a collection of uh, blog posts or essays. But there are fifty one thousand two hundred fifty six rows in it. It didn't. No, no, no. no, it didn't. And it it, and it it wasn't compatible with any other <laughs> formats. <either. laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a different story. Java uh, software. Yeah, yeah. You should check that out. In fact, we'll we'll, we'll link up mm. both uh, books from the blog so you can check them out if you haven't read them. Um, but yeah, just going back to lean startups. I didn't go to the event and I didn't have anything stolen. But so, uh, <laughs> but. The two things that stood out for me, which is interesting because maybe we've got slightly different perspectives, is the first thing was the, the minimum viable product yeah. I thought was great. Um, and I thought the thing that really stood out for me was Dropbox's MVP. It was mm. a video, mm. right? They didn't build anything. They just put a video out talking about what it would do. And the reaction from that gave them the confidence to go on and kind of develop their business, which yeah. is interesting. Um, you know, because we always think about having to build physical prototypes and invest a whole bunch of money up front to, to show people stuff. Actually, maybe not. Um, the second thing was the point you just touched on was um, entrepreneurs inside big companies. I thought that was actually really refreshing because sometimes I think there's this attitude that just because you work inside a big company, you just become a worker drone and you, you lose the ability to innovate or challenge. And I think you know there's some really interesting um, examples of how teams within organisations have developed some really interesting stuff and, and pushed the company in a very different direction. It doesn't always have to be the two guys in the garage kind of cliche. So I think it was quite refreshing to see you talk about that and, and recognise that. Totally, and, and, and I completely understand it at that level. There needs to be two books produced that, that fork. Yeah. The one that talks about how to be innovative within a big company, something that I've tried to do. Obviously, I've worked in big companies, I'm working in big companies, and then the startup thing. And then I think it opens it up the information that it can present then can be really, really focused mm. and it can be more practical and, that, you know, I, and that's just me. I, I think the Guy Kawasaki Art of the Start book is the template of these types of books that, um, that, you, that you were talking about. Yeah. You know, they're almost like a collection of blog posts, but it's kind of, it's, it's well curated kind of, um, yeah, you know, kind of just, just really pointy data and I think, I think that's highly valuable when you're a busy, you know, startup. Uh, Bad thing is, they're not very easy to convert into audiobooks. Right, so now is the really exciting part of the show. We've got our first ever guest on Hashbang TV, and we're with Tony Fish here, here in the Innovation Warehouse in London. James and Chris, hello. 
Hi Tony, how are you doing? Very, very well, thank you. Yourselves? So can you Good. just give us a bit of background? Tell us about yourself. How have you ended up here? What's your background? Well, obviously, welcome. Thank you to coming in to see the Innovation Warehouse. Background, I'm an engineer. Uh, and not only that, I'm a dyslexic engineer. <laughs> Therefore, I'm a proper engineer. Um, ended up somehow launching internet businesses back in 91. Um, in where we had an idea that you could do this protocol called TCPIP. You could put a set-top box on top of a TV. You could sit there with a remote control and download still images and then buy and reserve product. Back uh, in 1991? 91. Still have the plan. Uh, we raised the money in 93 and sold it out and went through heady days of the whole of the internet bubbles and bipes and ups and downs and just really enjoyed myself and just stayed in the market really of, of growing businesses which is what I love doing. Can you remember the exact sum you raised the first time in 1993? 1.3 million. 1.3 million wow. dollars or pounds? Pounds. Fantastic. And we couldn't get it from a venture market, we had to do an Offex listing which was a John Jenkins which is pre-AIM, um, pre-plus market because no VC believed us that actually this thing called TCPIP and the internet would work. Fantastic. So, so has that changed? Is it still hard to raise money? Uh, raising money is always hard. It always has been hard. Good ideas always get funded. And people who always complain that you can't raise money are usually people who've got a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How's Bardell's money raising money? Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a breeze. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. So, so tell us then about, um, what would you say your big personal success has been? I don't think there's one big success. What I am is on a journey. And, and I suppose you always come back and say, what do you want written on your headstone at the end of your life? And it's probably not you've got a big mansion and you drove a BMW. It's probably you want to, you know, your family, your wife, your kids. And actually, reality is what life's about. And it's having personal relationships. And actually, I think friendships that go through business all the way. And every time you do a business and it takes three to five years, you're with the same people, the same team, the same things are around you. And you carry on doing it. And I think the success I've got is 20 years in, I'm still working with people I've been with for 20 years. And that's what I love. So I'll, I'll take that as my success, I think. So balance and stability throughout all of those different business yeah. sort of cycles, you've kept the same balance and stability. Yeah. That sounds like success. I don't know if it's success, but it's, no, a, lot, it it's a lot of fun because then you have a chemistry with people. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. And so the Innovation Warehouse, how has it come about? How is it funded? What's it all about? What's its mission? Really great questions, and I actually haven't got the answers to them. Okay. We, 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 what we're trying to do is create somewhere where early stage growth businesses can grow. So actually I don't believe in startups. Okay. And the reason I don't believe in startups is because startup is a day. Okay, and when you go you fill in your forms, you send them off, you start it. And actually, okay, uh, Chris, you're a very nice guy. I'll give you I'll give you a honeymoon period. You can have two weeks and then call yourself a, a, a startup. After that, you're a business. Behave like a business, be a professional, grow things. Because actually, after a couple of weeks, you're either burning money or you're making money. Mm. So why pretend that you're a startup? What, what, what great shout does it give you? What we're after is points that companies are at an influx and they're about to grow. What mm. we're trying to do is find people who are about to grow, give them somewhere they can call a home, but they're with lots of other businesses who are also growing. So you've got sort of, I wouldn't say collaboration, but you're all in the same place and you've all got the same problems. And they part of them are funding, some are marketing, some are sales, but actually you're a community. Yeah. So we're trying to create a community that helps companies to grow. How it's going to work out, I don't know. Is it a lot of fun? Massive. When did it open? We opened, we came up with the idea a year and a half ago. We opened um, the doors to the first few companies in a, in a little tiny place uh, this time last year. Yeah. We moved to where we are in Smithfield now with 10,000 square foot in May last year. So we've been going six months. We've got 16 companies in at the moment. Um, we've had a couple of companies leave already because they've got too big for us. We've had three funding events. So we find it's right, but where it's going to go, no idea. It's That's going to be fantastic. fun. Yeah, totally. I mean, we've been around quite a few different co-working spaces. I work at an innovation center in Bath. It's all about creating the space and letting those free radicals bounce around. Yeah. And that's what they learn from, right? Yes. Interesting. And what, what do you see, I mean, you touch on Bath, what do you see across the whole of the UK? Do you see this kind of thing happening in other cities? Because obviously, you know, we want the show to be broad in its appeal and not just talk about London all the time. Yep. So, you know, are you plugged into other kind of innovation networks around the country? Yes, yeah, so, so the way we, we look at the way innovation happens is um, there's a personal preparedness 
So how do you personally get prepared to go and build a business? And there's a lot of places all over the UK which help people from education, coaching, training, mentoring, which will get people prepared. And there's lots of those, and that's fantastic. The next stage really is the, the Y Combinators, the springboards, the seed camps, the boot camps, which take the team, the product, the service, and the business to actually something that's tradable that you can do something with, and we call that business preparedness. So your personal getting prepared, then business preparedness, both of those are brilliantly covered. Then you've actually got a business. Now with the business you can go one of three ways. You can go DIY, you can go to a Regis office, set up, off you go, happy days, you're on your own, you believe your own PowerPoint, probably not a great place. You can go to places where you're kind of like working with other people but you're not and we're not sure quite how they're going to work out because actually they're driven by occupancy so they want people in but they don't really want them to grow because they're paying the rate and therefore they don't want churn. We're here, we want people to churn really quickly. And what we're trying to do is, is create environments where the collaboration happens, where the co-creation works, where innovation sparks off its ideas, where actually you want companies in for as short a time as possible because actually they're going to grow or they're actually going to say no business, time to go really reflect and go and do something else. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I don't know, I think that across the UK we've got lots of things in place. Uh, Cameron, uh, David Cameron came out with the announcement on Monday that they've got hundreds of spaces across the UK from government which they're going to start to give to incubators and we're in discussion with a lot of other people about how that works. We don't see we compete with any other incubator. We see we, we want to take people out of Springboard, we want to take them from Y Combinator, from CCAP. We want to help grow them but then they will probably go on to another office we're just part of an ecosystem of growth. Right. And so there, there is no one right model, it's about chemistry, getting mm. people together. And you're also involved in the, the mashup events? How, how, how does that work? So, so mashup's a community of uh, specifically more than anything in London, there's 5,000 entrepreneurs who, who just want to be part of a community across digital, finance, tech, media, retail, wholesale, every industry you've got, yeah. probably less pharmaceuticals and petrochemicals, but most other industries, who are trying to work out where the opportunities are and how they grow. And we drag people together. Um, uh, we've got one next week on, on local and social meeting. But where's the opportunity? Where's actually the business? And we've got some companies coming in saying, this is where they think it is. And then just having a debate, discussion, and sharing ideas. And again, community. Yeah, interesting. That's a nice segue into the next question. It is, yeah. So. Um, You've, you obviously see a lot of startup businesses around sort of software, no startup, tech, early where, stage growth companies. Sorry, a lot of early stage <laughs> companies. But it's all around, you know, the web, data, tech, you yes. know, software. Yes. Um, what trends have you spotted in the last couple of years? Look, looking forward, the next couple of years. Where is it if you were if you were looking to start something? Yep. What what area would you see as ripe for exploitation with a new company? So I have a particular heart. Therefore, I'm focused on two areas, which are really mobile and digital footprint. They're the two things that I really, really love. Mobile because it's absolutely unique in certain things you can do with it. Digital footprint because it's data. It's things that you're giving away and how you can trade them. I think what's going to be interesting is there's two industries which are going to go through radical transformation in the next couple of years, which is the finance industry and the telecom industry. And the reason I say that is if you consider a model in the web is collect data, store data, analyze the data, create some value, then see how people have reacted to your analysis and create the feedback to create more data. And it's a closed loop. And that's what we do. So we collect data, we store data, we analyze the data, we feed it back. Lovely. Love that. You can see how Google works, you can see how Amazon works, you can see recommendation, you can see, te you can see lots of things happening. Um, then we've got these industries called telecoms and banking. Mm. And why the infrastructure is absolutely there. So the, the telecoms infrastructure enables that to happen. But it doesn't actually participate. Banking as well, it facilitates it happening, it enables it to happen, but it's not a participant. And now you can start to trade without a currency, and you can barter without currency. You look at these two industries and you go, guys, you might have all the pipes, but you're not actually participating. So they're ripe for total disruption to how they could participate in this closed loop system. Not just by providing pieces of wire, but actually being part of what they what, what's coming along. So therefore that comes around to look at particularly identity, which is one of the aspects as a web we haven't solved as yet. Fascinating. Do you think there will be one kind of owner of identity? How do you see that playing out? I don't see one owner of identity. I don't know what identity is. 
and I don't I think you've written a book about it. Yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the reason I don't know what identity is. <laughs> because the more you think about it, yeah. what is identity? And, and my, my common phrase, obviously, is, is um, actually Tony Fish doesn't actually exist. I have no birth certificate, I have no bank account, I don't have a mortgage, I have nothing. Because actually my name is not Tony Fish. But you do have on your website the statistics about how many other Tony Fishes there are and where they live. Correct. Are they all made up as well then? Most of them are, because we started off with the name Vansky Fish. Ah, okay. And you shorten it, and people don't have, they have different personas, so you could say it's a persona. Well, I have two Facebook accounts, explain that. Easy, yeah. you've got a professional one and a work one. Yeah. Well, you've also got your mates, which, you know. Yeah, but, I don't want to mix the two. So but I, his identity. Yeah, exactly. I introduce myself as Bookmeister more than I do Chris Book yeah. now, because that's it. That's where people, that's my one place where people can get to. Change your identity. So ah, it does. But it's if you try to open a Google Plus account with that name, they reject you yes. because it's not a proper name. Yeah. And so you've got these name wars going along. Who are you? Oh, I, so you haven't got a, conf, you know, a, 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 an Anglo Saxon professional two bit name. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, so yeah. we don't know what identity is. What we've, we've got two aspects of identity that's important. One is this trust between each other, that somehow we recognise somebody, we build trust into mm. a relationship and therefore we're prepared to trade, whatever. The second one is access. So you want access to a building, you need some form of verification, mm. authentication, and people bundle that into the identity as well. And then we bundle it all back to our name and our date of birth, which actually is only a certificate given by government. Mm. So, so are the government ever going to crack these major kind of big data projects like the passport agency databases and stuff like that? Or are we doomed to see these failures time and time again? I, I think what's interesting on those, those aspects is the, there's a number of people in the web who are completely rethinking how data exists, mm. which I find personally fascinating. So at the moment, we've got this idea of storing all data. We store it in a great big database, and then we secure the database, and we either encrypt it or put lots of firewalls up. Then the web comes along and says, why do you do that? Why don't you distribute the data everywhere? And actually you make it completely public. You might encrypt it in each different place, but you only put all the data everywhere, so you never store it, so there's no one weakness. Mm -hmm. The second thing you say is, well, what I, all I need is a pointer. So if you've got data, I only need the pointer to where the data is. So we don't store storing data everywhere, we start taking the pointers. Then the question comes along is, what rights has Chris got to either his own data, some of my data, data we've co-created, or your billing records, which actually is not yours, but somebody else's. Therefore, you end up with data and rights. Mm. So data can exist anywhere as a pointer, and rights can exist anywhere as a pointer. You end up with this idea of actually what you want to do is weave, or combine these together to create value. And so the web's going towards a point of saying, you don't need data. You need to know where it is, and you need to know rights, and then we'll start combining the two. Completely different ideologies. Hmm. Therefore, these big data projects, yeah, if I was IBM, I'm sure I'd be selling it. But <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> I'm okay. not, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so just to wrap up then, what, what would your number one tip be to a kind of early stage company trying to, to you know, establish themselves in the UK market? Uh, top tip. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, we lost Steve Jobs last year. I'm not an Apple fanboy in the slightest for a variety of different reasons. But one thing that Steve brought in spades to everything he did was passion. And you read his book and there's lots of both sides of the story and you just read, I just read passion. And then you start looking around the rest of the world. You look at great people who have done great things and actually see passion. Yeah. And if I don't see passion in the companies that come through the front door here, it's kind of like, go get some. Yeah. Because without it, you will just get stuck at a point where either the projects are, are no interesting projects is delivering enough cash, it becomes a bit of a lifestyle, yeah. you, you, you get to a structure and skills and you want to control it, you're missing passion. And if you And that's really interesting because passion is something you can't teach. You can't. You know, you can learn to code, you can learn marketing, yeah. you can yeah. learn business, but yeah. if you haven't got that in your DNA, you can't get people excited about your ideas. And why are you doing what you're doing? Because you've got We're trying to ask that question as well actually. Yeah, but there's a passion yeah. for it. And I suppose and with that, that's what drives people forward, and that's what makes success out of things. Hmm. It is delivering something that you actually want to do. Yeah, and to keep persevering, you need you need that passion. That's what drives the, yeah. the, the you know, you just got to hang in there. Yeah. You can't give up at the first hurdle. You have to just keep bashing them down and keep going. And so passion is the engine of that. And what I love is the kids that are coming through. And I say kids, not in derogatory, but just the younger generation yeah. coming through. I love it because they turn up at work, and if they don't enjoy it after a couple of weeks, they leave. Yeah. Well, we would have stayed there for five years. Yeah, and, oh, well, and you, okay, you know, I'm not allowed to leave this until I get a new opportunity. They're just out the door. 
I saw some research recently that college students in the US now expect to work for 17 companies or something yeah. crazy in their lifetime, well, which well, is unheard of, right? Oh, absolutely. Better than that, I see people graduating and going straight into the, their own business, yeah. you know, starting their own thing, yeah. straight out of university. More the, of that. What, we've, what um, We did some research uh, about a year ago, and, and the indication was yeah, your granddad had one profession. Yeah. Your dad probably had three jobs. Our generation may have four or five jobs. The next series of generation of, of children are probably going to have three jobs at the same time. Yes. Their children are probably going to have three professions. And so we're seeing a complete change in the way we're going to work. And that the actually, you won't work for one company, you will have a skill, and that skill may be actually shared across four or five companies at the same mm. time. Mm. Interesting. That's a Charles Handy type thing, isn't it? Portfolio worker idea. Yeah. He's coming. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, not all, it won't apply to everything, but mm. if you look at digital skills, where the passion is, you can see where it's going to go. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. I think right. it's very exciting. I'm really excited about the next few years. And I know the environment's not great, but that's where actually people will disrupt and create awesome ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you Fantastic. very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being our you. first ever guest. Oh. <laughs> Pleasure to come back. <laughs> yeah. Great, awesome. thanks. Cheers, Tom. Thank you. Okay, other stories uh, from the past week or so. Turntable FM. We're big Love fans. Turntable FM. We're always on Turntable FM. Uh, and Facebook have released something that is very similar. Mm. Uh, not similar in the way that it looks, but similar in functionality. Listen with friends. Listen with your friends. So yeah. how does it work? How do, how do you think it threatens what Turntable FM has built? Well, I mean, you're right. They The feel of it is very, very different. Turntable has this really kind of uh, engaging, but very kind of basic user interface where you get up on stage, you, you're DJing, you've got your little LCD, kind of uh, display showing what you're playing, you've got the crowd bobbing. That's part of what makes it fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, the, so the concept though at the heart of it is playing music to your friends that they might not have heard, so you get to discover new music that you wouldn't have come across. So it's kind of like you know just playing last FM radio stations, you just type in who you like and it just pumps stuff out at you and you can discover, right? So it's that kind of concept. So the Facebook functionality now allows you to um, start spinning tracks through Facebook's platform and you know you have your chat box where you can see your friends are online, you can just click on those guys to start you know, playing that music to them. So from a conceptual perspective it's very similar, you know, I guess group sharing of, of music. Mm. So you, know, you can either just sit back passively and listen or with Turntable FM you can actually step up to the decks and start spinning your own tracks as well. So I think it's much, you know, Turntable FM is much more fun. It's much more collaborative. It's got a, you know, different user interface, different vibe about it. Much more of a community kind of feel. A bit more hardcore musicy, I think. Whereas, I guess Facebook, you know, you're gonna, you might have share the same music interests as your kind of uh, friends, but maybe not, because you know, in, in Turntable FM, you can group rooms around niches of music. So you know you're going into a room where people like the same sort of stuff as you do. Yeah. Whereas on Facebook, I mean, you and I share broadly the same kind of music tastes, but you know, a lot of people I'm friends with on Facebook can't stand the crap that I play. So yeah. I'm not sure it's going to kind of it's going to kind of work. Yeah. But you know, the bad news though is, what does a company the size of Turntable do when a monster like Facebook starts to kind of edge into their space? Well, it's, been, it's got a name. It's been it's called being Sherlocked. And it comes from uh, a company whose name I forget, uh, who launched a product called Sherlock, piece of software, and Apple launched it, you know, a month after they had. Right. Completely wiped them out. And it happened to the same company again. Oh, it wasn't a post guys, was it? Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. But that was an example, yeah. True. Um, uh, that yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. But no, no, this was uh, some, some other piece of software, and that's why it's called Sherlock, you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and yeah, I mean, what do you do? I guess you What's just. What's being Watson? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Why uh, that's, That was the name of the software uh, product that was, okay. you know, first coined right, Sherlock right, 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 right. Uh, because the software was called Sherlock. Presumably it was kind of, you know, an investigative piece of software or something, I don't know. Mm. Uh, but what do you do? I don't know. I, you, you, I guess you carry on. There's a massive difference between Facebook and, and Turntable FM though, is that you choose to enter Turntable FM and you choose the room that you go into. Yeah. And that in itself, you know, you try and get, get a... Yeah, it's more of an engaged thing, yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas, whereas the Facebook thing, I see it a bit more like, you know, on the right hand side of Spotify, you have your Facebook friends and you kind of see what they've been listening to. I suppose it's more live than that, but 
I don't know. There's so much you can do with Facebook now. It's almost yeah. I don't want to go there. There's yeah. just too much. Going. You yeah. just want a single standalone product, and that, and and that's I think that's what that's the answer to this idea of being sure locked. You know, there are other businesses. Just be good. Be really good at one focus. Yeah, you have to be yeah. the audio book company. You have to be the social listening company. Yeah. I think as soon as you try and and, and we know that from working in big companies as well. You're trying to do too many different things, that's whereas really folks, and that's where startups and disruption and all yeah. that thing comes from. Is that's all we're ever going to do, yeah. and we'll be good at it, and we'll be the best. And and nowadays with the apps and the web app experience, you know, it's all about the user experience. And if you're listening in like one single use case and, and innovating, you know, back to the lean startup thing, experimenting, you will be the big company every single time, regardless of how much cash, marketing, and everything else. You can take them on, and they might acquire you. If, yeah, that's, well, if you want to exit, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, yeah. get that opportunity. That's really interesting because that's almost like how why the whole app thing is exploding, right? You know, you kind of people are rejecting the kind of do it all portals like you know Yahoo is a great example, right? The Yahoo portal just grew and grew and grew into loads of different services, but it, it became meaningless mm. and soulless, right? What did it stand for? No one quite could ever figure that out. And then you know, with this advent of apps, it's now about you know, small little things that focus on one thing, like Instagram, right? There's loads of photography apps. Yeah. But Instagram comes along, does one thing really well, the filters, that makes it easy to upload. And, you know, they explode. So that, that's quite, a, that's, mm. you know, for you, that's quite an interesting observation, actually. But, uh, <laughs> Thanks. That's, uh, I mean, that was praise. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, I, th I think the, the one thing that is, you know, a problem, I think, for startups like, um, turntable is their clout in terms of the record labels so you know you and I were early adopters of turntable it got shut down in, in outside the US because of music rights you know they haven't got the legal teams or the cash that Facebook have got to just go and batter down the doors of the the, the record label execs right yeah yeah that, that's a real problem I think yeah and, and we know that Spotify spent a lot of money doing those deals there's minimal uh, you know minimum revenue guarantees there yeah. <laughs> you have to raise a lot of money to be able to do that, so, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got some personal issues with the record industry because I've tried to launch music services in the past, and oh, yeah. my God. But I met a really interesting guy called uh, Neil um, Tynegate, who works for Open EMI. They've just, EMI? EMI, yeah. They've just set up um, a kind of innovation unit, which is actually looking at APIs and how they can open up their catalogue and, and encourage developers to build services on top. Which is kind of interesting and, and kind of like a really positive step in the right direction, right? Absolutely. We should get Neil on and he can yes. talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we're big fans of Apogee and Sam Ramji and, and, and we're starting to see it happen, you know. Pearson have a bunch of APIs that allow certain types of content to be accessed. EMI are doing open EMI. The BBC are going down that with the... So I met with Bill Thompson from BBC mm. um, and they're trying to open up the BBC archive. Can you imagine how difficult that is in terms of length and size... You know, you know, history of, of all of that content, yeah. but the licensing, the licensing issues with that, you know, some things are dead. Yeah. You know, but but the idea is that if you can open it up for other people to to access it, at least. do you know what I've always wanted? And I will pay a <laughs> fortune. Yeah. You go to the BBC archive, you type in your favourite band, and you can pull down every TV appearance they've ever done. Whistle test, Top of the Pops, all of that stuff. How awesome would that be? Bill demoed that last week at Tech Hub. Really? Yeah. So, that's, so, that, so all of that footage is digitalised and it's uh, really... No, 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 I think only 20% of the archive is digitalised right now. that's the thing, now. right? I mean, I don't like mainstream bands, nor do you really. So how, you know, the stage when you can go and type in a band name that, you know, isn't U2 or Madonna. So, so, so what, what they're doing is uh, there, there will be a taxonomy that you'll be able to search and find the resources. You might not be able to access those resources unless you have the rights. And that's the challenge. If they really want to be innovative, they have to. We have to sort out. And, and unfortunately, it's a law change in the UK that will be required. Mm -hmm. I think in order to be able to, it's almost a bit like the donor card thing. You know, it almost needs to be opt in. Yeah. You know, it, 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 the default is that you're opted in. Yeah. Um, and if you, you know, if abuse is found of that copyright material from the BBC archive, then there might be a way of of handling it. Because otherwise, it will just never happen. Uh, and what a waste. You know, we paid for that content to be produced over. The, in your case, eighty years. In my case, twenty-four years. I you know, on my telly once. Yeah, yeah. You so, got a CRT though. You told us last week. I, I do have a CRT. So last time uh, we talked about the Application Developers Alliance. 
yeah. uh, and you have an update. I do have an update. Yeah, I spoke to um, Jake um, from the Alliance. Had a chat with him on uh, Monday, I think it was. And uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, sounds like you know they agree um, with a lot of the kind of challenges that we pointed out Good. in the preview show. Um, some of the kind of answers he gave some real clarity on was, um, yep, yeah, it's an international um, organization. So interesting that they said, you know, they were going to originally focus on the US, but the demand has been so great, um, they're moving international sooner than planned. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think he told me they signed up 2,300 in the first three weeks. That's good. And about five to 700 are outside the US. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, he recognises the fact that one organisation trying to speak for lots of different fragmented communities is going to be really hard. And I think I think I read that um, the read where on my blog. Uh, I don't know. About was, it, was it on my blog? Do you have a blog? I thought you had a little sound prepared. I did. Didn't work. You did did you it? Screwed it up. Unbelievable. Don't fail. Fail. Second time. time you failed today. Next time, mention your blog. You know. My blog. Okay. Right. Yeah. So carry on. Uh, I think I read, probably not on your blog, actually. Uh, you read other things than my blog. <laughs> I thought you exclusively. That's too loud. <laughs> it kind of worked. Um, we're going to work on the sound effect stuff. Sorry, yeah. sorry kids. Yeah. Um, I think, where did I read it? In an email, I expect. Um, <laughs> the, the people, the sort of management structure are going to be developers. So it's not going to yeah. be, they're not going to be influenced by larger organisations. Um, I so, did write that, yes. Yes, so that was good. So, that was good. did you write that on your blog? I did write that on my blog. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that's encouraging that the, the developers themselves will be steering the, the organisation. Okay, and yeah. it's called the Application Developers Alliance, ADA, ADA, that's a software language, right? From the ARC. Really? Yeah, did you not know that? No. So, I've learned something today. Mm. Maybe, maybe you could. Maybe other people have. Maybe you could update that on your blog. <laughs> <laughs> it's working now. Yeah, it's good. I'll keep the ass at that. <laughs> well done. Okay. Let's not do that anymore. Okay, so yeah, so and, and actually they're going to be in Europe for the um, the DevCon, BlackBerry DevCon. All oh, right, cool. I'll and be part of the DevCon. Yeah, yeah so you, can go, you can go and hang out. Cool. So, so I went for breakfast this morning. Um, we're in Smithfields, right? So big famous meat market. Where well, was my invite? Well, I was meeting someone quite important. Okay. Um, and. Um, Kind of one thing I use, right, is a test of people. Forget all the HR stuff and the management theory. It's their choice about to use red sauce or brown sauce on particular foods. Right. <laughs> so that's this is my interview strategy, right, for people. Okay. So it's like you can either <laughs> knowing the people you've employed that explains yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll give you an example, right? So if you're having cheese on toast, there's only one right answer. Would you have brown sauce or red sauce? It has to be ketchup, red sauce. <laughs> so that's the wrong answer. What? So, on cheese on toast? Yes. Are you having a laugh? No. You can't have brown sauce with cheese on toast. Of course toast. you do, because it's savoury. Rubbish. Yeah. What, so you have red sauce on sweet stuff? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> ketchup. You're full of shit. <laughs> ketchup is sweet. You don't want sweet stuff on cheese on toast. You don't have brown sauce, which you, you have Worcester sauce on cheese on toast, no, or you have red sauce and you This isn't a condiment Olympics, it's tomato sauce <laughs> or brown sauce. <laughs> condiments Olympics. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should have, condiments Olympics segment every week. Um, well, anyway, I'm, going, I'm going to a hackathon. Give me another uh, example. Uh, uh, no, I'm going to a hackathon at the weekend, yeah. which is all about building apps for the Olympics. I may well make a condiment a Olympics app. Can I get the IPR for that? Then? Innovation, no, it's okay. Right, right there's, there's uh, another example then. So if cheese on toast is controversial, there's, there's pixel <laughs> Controversial? It's bacon sandwich. It's got to be brown sauce. <laughs> Actually, that's where I... Oh, what a minute! That's kind of 50-50, depending on the mind. The typical one then is full English breakfast, right? Because egg goes with the ketchup, but the sausage and the bacon, brown. So how do you go? Do you, which Again, way do you go? I'm going to break the rule. <laughs> No, no, no. If, there's no if, third if, choice. If the main, and I'm vegetarian, if the main product is sausage, yeah? So if it's about a sausage fry up, you know, there's two or three sausages in there, it has to be mustard. You take mustard to a sausage first. <laughs> I, have, I have mustard on my sausage. And veggie sausages especially. But I always have lots of salt, lots of pepper and mustard. If if it's just a fry up and I, there's no mustard, then I'll have brown sauce, not red. You're breaking the rules. Am I? Well, it's brown or red. You're from Bedford. Yes, 
What's that got to do with it? Well, it probably <laughs> explains a lot about your strange, you know, source habits. Okay. Anyway. Go back to that. Well, we, so, you know, so Continental we need, Olympics. And we need people to suggest foods that we can ask that question of. Maybe. Okay. And we should start with cheese on toast, because there's no debate there, are there? Maybe we could change the poll on the website from who looks more handsome to... But the poll doesn't ask that. Yeah, maybe we could change the poll to, be, to ask that. Right. Cheese on toast, red sauce, brown sauce. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Okay, so okay. That, we'll make that change. Perfect. That's it. That's that's Brent coming to the end of our first uh, first show proper. Exciting. Episode number one yes. in the bag. Yeah. Tony Fish was a star. He was. Absolutely brilliant. And he will go down in history. He's the first, maybe only. <laughs> <laughs> Very likely to be the only on Hash ever Bang guest. Yes. TV. Hash Bang dot TV. Hash Bang TV. Hashbang TV. Yes. Excellent. So what do we want people to, uh, you know, we, we need uh, people to interact with us, we want people to send us stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, so... so uh, yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if you watch the preview show, we, uh, we were talking about t-shirts. Ah, yes. So we want, we want MS-DOS t-shirts. We do. We want any kind of old tech t-shirts that you might have lying around. You're wearing an Alpha Pond t-shirt. Oh, yeah, yeah. So part of our, uh, part of our um, kind of new friends that are helping us put this stuff together, Alpha Punk are helping out. So go check them out, even though their website is terrible. I, I don't have an Alpha Punk t-shirt. I never got one. No, you don't have any very good t-shirts at all. This is a good t-shirt. It says Earth Keepers. Do you have a t-shirt that wasn't made t-shirt. before 1995? Yeah, I do, but I wouldn't wear them on television. Well, why? I don't know. I just like old t-shirts. They're not on television. Well, we will be soon. As my son has repeatedly told me, <laughs> this isn't on TV, Dad. You're deluding yourself. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And, and talking of feedback, nice segue. So yeah, we want feedback. We want to know the kind of guests that you want us to interview. Um, we want obviously uh, t-shirts we talked about. We need your views on important topics of the day, like bread, bread or brown sauce on cheese on toast. Uh, or any tech trends type stuff. It'd be interesting in people's tech views trends. Oh yeah, technology. it's a tech show, isn't it's it? It's supposed to yeah, be. Yeah, it's right, supposed yeah, to be, but you that. do your best to. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so in terms of guests, are we going to select them based on their clout st- score? Clout score. Probably not. No, okay. we want this to be a democracy, right? Okay. You don't have to be a celebrity. How's a- your cloud score doing? <laughs> don't talk to me about oh. my cloud score. Oh, right. It's gone through the floor. Has it? Yeah. Ever since I started eating sushi. Oh, uh, right. I don't know why. <laughs> it's uh, bizarre. I need to do some analytics on that. But my peer index score is better than yours. Is it? So we should talk about peer index, not cloud. And they're also uh, UK. They are company. a UK company. So they're based in Tech Hub, right? They are. We're going to get them on the show. We should. We should get them on the show. So let's not talk about cloud. They're in San Francisco, right? I don't know. Who cares? You've got that on your t-shirt. I have. Yeah. 49ers are free to the Super Bowl? No, they lost. No, the 49ers won, didn't they? No, they lost. Did they? Best best Sunday afternoon. No ever. way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought they so lost. The, no, it's the Giants against the Patriots. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, there you so, go. Yeah. Strange game. Yeah. Will it take off? Who knows? I doubt it. But anyway. Okay. So... Wrapping up this uh, this first proper episode, um, we'll be back next time. We will more amazing guests, send more humane your... rubbish. Probably, yeah. <laughs> send, send us your thoughts, lots of feedback. Very yeah. welcome. Okay. Till right. next time.